a geometric group action or not. And there was, I think we made some, some headway with that, but we got stuck. At, well, the group that I was working with uh, got stuck. And um, I don't like to walk away with the function. You know what I mean? Like, it's... So uh, let's review. Uh, so a group action on, on our square, we remember that the identity of the group has to fix the element and that associativity has to be well behaved. And then to be a geometric group action, it has to preserve um, distances, in this case, whatever we decide that to mean, has to be properly discontinuous, <coughs> with lowercase d, and um, action, the action must be co-compact, which for this, this was the part that we got stuck on, was that we couldn't visualize, we couldn't figure out what the orbit space was, let alone prove it was, uh, prove it was compact. So reviewing what the, what the group was, so it was a group generated by two elements with the relations a squared and b cubed, and the action was uh, defined on the, the hyperbolic plane, um, the, using the upper half of the complex plane model um, with, with, these, with these actions. Um, the, a little later on, we're going to get a little bit more intuition about how what these these do. But um, I'm part of the I'm part of the motivation for my talk is using you know how to use computers when we're lost and we have no idea what's going on. So um, all right. This is my picture of the right. So the my idea was to take the to take the Cayley graph and sort of embed it in r squared as defined by the, the action above. So to take this guy and the, the for some point that we start with, then build the Cayley graph, but the, you know, for each relation in the edge generator, we actually point, you know, graph that on the, on the complex plane. The, all right, so this was my course geometry. It's out of focus here. All right, so the, my initial idea on what the, the orbit space was, um, was that it would be one of these, uh, so this is from, from x equals zero to x equals one, and um, the, if you look at what b does to this, b will take this line here and, and bring it here, and b will take this line here and, and bring it here. And so I was convinced that this, this sliver here was our, was our orbit space. Um, which is kind of funny because talking to one of the other groups, um, they had figured out that it was, it was much, much less than this. They were making the argument that we could do it with, uh, with just one quarter of the unit circle. That one quarter of the unit circle was in fact, was already too much. And so the sort of keep those things in mind as we look at some of these images to, um, you know, just sort of to see how, where we go with this. So, all right, so how does the program work? So we feed it, we feed it one, one point, whatever point we wanted to start off with, and then it immediately will calculate b on that point and b squared on that point. And it takes those three points and feeds it into like a next list. And uh, the program will then iterate over, you know, in each iteration of the, the program, it'll take the next list, make it the now list, and for each element point in the now list, it'll take that point, do A on that point, A, then B on that point, A, B, and then B squared on that point. And then it'll take, you know, these two points and put it into the next list and then go back to the, to the next point in the now list. Please stop me at any point if you have questions. I'm a big fan of audience participation and people stopping me when I've stopped making sense. All right, right on. I'll take that as an excellent slide. All right, so this is, um, so I'm going to pick on this point uh, one half plus the square root of three over two i, um, because it's one of the points that I said was in my orbit space and was one of the points. It's on the unit circle, and so it was in one of the points in y'all's pseudo orbit space. And so, well, I mean, you guys were you knew that it wasn't that there was more than the the orbit space at that point. And so, all right, so what do we see here? What a couple observations to immediately make is that there's sort of this integral stratification as we, as we move out, that each time we iterate, we end up moving, moving out. And then also, each time we iterate, 
we move down, but not quite in an integral fashion. You know, so here's one, and then we bounce. This is the wrong image, but I'm the only person who does this. Right. So it sort of moves down in this in this sort of logarithmic way where it, you know, one comes down one factor and then one factorth of that factor and then one factor of that factor. So if you sort of like shift this slightly, it would be, you know, it would come down to one half and then one fourth and then one eighth and so on. Does that make sense? So is this the orbit space of just that point? This is some number of iterations of it on like Correct. all the different colors? It's not, it's not like you're doing different points. No, correct. Okay. So we feed it one point, and it produces the graph with that starting point. Um, What's the meaning of the colors? So each, each iteration is a different color. I wanted to sort of see where the graph was going, which is a, a little bit of, well, be, which, good question. If that becomes important in the, in the near future. All right, so some of the problems that I had with this, come back. Uh, one of the problems that I had with was with this was that there was this <laughs> huge um, there was a party going on down here that it was really hard to understand sort of what was going on down here because it was getting really really dense and um, as pretty as I think this is um, I think the lines are also sort of obfuscating what's what's going on and so the actually before we we jump to that um, so right so remember I was convinced that the the orbit space was a little sliver right here. And so one of the things that I wanted to convince myself of was that by getting any points in this sliver, you could get every other point on the plane. And so by getting really close to the origin here, you can see that we, our Cayley graph actually bounced, started bouncing all over the, all over the plane. But again, in this sort of, in this really systematic, systematic fashion. So if we get even closer to the, to the origin, you see it, Oh, so these points are all congregated in, in just a few places. There's, you know, there's a bunch up here, and this is sort of the integral spacing out we see happening here, and then a few spots down here. So one of the things that I observed was that the, the, for the most part, it's a Cayley graph. You know, once you fit, feed it its initial point, it kind of establishes where the top bar is. Like, so there, it immediately hits the max, but never goes beyond that. Which I thought was interesting because the, it, this action will, will push, you know, will keep moving down closer and closer to the real line, but it won't keep moving higher and higher in the other direction. Which, um, which seems counterintuitive to me. Um, so this is a detail of, of what's going on on the upper left. And if you look at a detail of what's going on in the, with, around the origin, it's, it's something really similar to um, what happens when we, when we feed it the, the canonical point. So one thing that I did notice is that there was a little, little tiny bit of moving up. So this is like um, the us zooming in on this spot right here. <laughs> uh, and um, the, the and so this is a little a bump up, and I couldn't I have yet to convince myself that I don't think this is ever going to break the the um, get higher than one thousand, which was the, the previous line that we had established before by the other point. But there's no way to computationally establish this because this program runs is is you know has exponential growth. And to feed it something that, I mean, to get it up that high, we need to do, you know, thousands, many, many, like a million iterations. And that just sounds big and scary to me. Um, but anyway, so outward integral stratification, downward log of integral stratification. Um, within a tiny region, we can get all of the other numbers, maybe. And um, it only steps down and never up. Mostly. Um, so, right, so let's look at this again, but let's lose the lines, and let's also be able to draw the y-axis on the, on the log scale. And so this is, um, 
So this is our, so this is negative one half, which I'm going to say is the same thing as one half because you do a b on it and pushes it over. Um, the, and so you, we, we see, again, we see this, this sort of integral stratification doesn't just happen up here, but happens down here as well. But that there's a, a sort of clumping action going on down here. And so once we look at it in the log scale, we get to see a little bit more what that, that clumping action is. Um, something that, that I think is really interesting is that if you stare at this long enough, if you have that kind of time, um, you sort of see that as we move down, there's a little bit of like this hints of geometry forming here. Even though it gets confused, it's sort of, it's not just clumping. It's not like what happens with, you know, Z, um, when, we, when we have sort of our circle, a two pi around the circle, and we just move around by integer in increments. You know how that sort of like produces this even kind of, it clumps everywhere. Does that make sense? Make sense? Awesome. No, that's not that's not what we get what we get here. Sort of what one of the one of the things that you can see here is that um, that the which with each iteration you see that the you know all the purples are kind of like down at the bottom. And you know the the you know as we iterate these points don't actually move back up. So we can, once we get to a certain, we can pick like a point on the, on the plane and be like, all right, so it's, we, can re, we can pick an epsilon around this point and be fairly confident that the graph isn't going to come back and hit that point. And so this will give us, even though I wasn't trying to find an argument that this is properly discontinuous, it was properly discontinuous, um, which I thought was neat. Um, and so... Right, so the, but I wasn't convinced with, with the, you know, that the clumping was actually smooth, so I cranked up the iterations. This is 13 iterations, which took two minutes, and that's kind of the limit for my patients, and sort of, like, I was concerned that the computer would get, like, squiffy if I asked it to work harder than that. Um, so again, we sort of have this, this uh, stratification over the integers, and then, Let's, if we zoom in on one of the, I'm going to zoom in here on this one here, and starting at about five to here, and just to sort of see what's going on in there. You sort of see within each stratum, there's also this, this stratification within, the, within each stratum. And then if we, I think I grab this one here, and if I then zoom in on this guy here, sort of look how similar, you know, this sort of has this very similar geometry, you know, zoomed in than this guy is when we're zoomed out. So I, I suspect, while this is nowhere close to rigor, that there's infinite levels of stratifications. Um, the a stratum, you know, right, where was I going with this? All right. So, right, the stratum within the stratum within the stratum, da da da. That's Cobb would definitely be pleased. Um, demonstratively, points in my orbit are hit more than once, right? So, just to go back, go back to here. So the the circle, the the right, the first quadrant of the circle would start here, and then come up. And here, so the circle's really, really stretched out, and we can see that there's sort of infinitely many points that get that are representing here, being represented here more than once. Um, and so clearly, my tiling of the plane was much, much. It was way, way, way too big. Um, so what to do? So once we're convinced that we're wrong, because it's a lot easier to prove something that's right than prove something that's wrong. We don't. Uh, waste time doing that. Um, the was to check out the literature that had already been written about this group, um, and I found this picture, which um, was making an argument about what the orbit space was. But one of the things that immediately appealed to me about this was the the crossings here. Uh, so this is was was a crossing crossings here, and these 
these crossings of these circles here seem to, now this is only five iterations that, that this image has done. And you sort of notice that up here the crossings are very sparse. There is an upper limit to how far up the, the um, you know, these crossings are. But they can get arbitrarily close to the, the, um, the real axis. So, sorry, what's this a picture of? Uh, that's, that's a good question. But I'm just saying, like, why this picture initially appealed to me when, it, when I was, that this, that the right answer is somewhere, that this is related to what, what we're talking about. So this is uh, compliments of Wikipedia, and the, the, the module, um, and the article about the modular group, which is a few steps away from, there's a little bit of work to say that what they're talking about, what I'm talking about, are the, are the same thing. Um, and then is this Mobius or Mobius? Are you talking about the Mobius group? Um, the article, this is an image from the article called the modular group. Okay. Um, this is an argument about how that group, which I'm saying is also my group, um, the, that this, this shaded region um, the, is the orbit space and um, you can, this is like a tessellation of the hyperbolic plane and that all of these guys are triangles, which I think requires a little bit of work to explain, you know, how this is, how this is working. Um, are all the intersection points of those triangles, or not, I guess this, this here, here the circles, um, I guess on the orbit of a point, is that a point moving to each intersection? Okay, so I'm going to say yes, but that, you know, that's, that's sort of the impression that I've gotten at this, at this point, that, so the, you know, I was looking at the orbit of, of these two points here, and that, you know, looking at these two points, these crossings are giving, you know, sort of give us a picture that's a little bit of evo evocative of the, the work that we got as well. And so this, this gives us a little bit of intuition on how, if we wanted to prove that this is actually, that this is actually our orbit space, that this does tile the plane over the, you know, with our group action, then what we could do is we could look at you know, these just triples of points, these triangles, and look that, and make an argument about how our group action will always, you know, will always send, you know, these points to another triple of these points and do something and live happily ever after. Um, the, right, so to just make it, to sort of finish this argument that it's, um, that this is a, that this is co-compact, we, we, we have to add the real line here, which we only have two problem points with here, is that here at zero and here at negative one, and explain and, and infinity. And so we just say that A acts on this point by sending it to infinity, and that B acts on this point by sending it to infinity, and say B acts on infinity by, by sending it to one of these points. I think, I think it's this point right here. No, I lied. Yep, yes, to this point right here. And that A acts on infinity, on the point at infinity by bringing it down here. And if you sort of look at this as being the, you know, the stereographic projection from the sphere to the, to the complex plane, and look at these actions as they behave on the sphere, it doesn't it doesn't seem like we're doing anything that outrageous. It, that the action sort of makes sense within this within this context. And so, um, this spot is, is actually the same as this. And then once you add this point and add that point at infinity, this most definitely is compact, and it's co -com And then our action is co-compact, and we can all live happily ever after. Well. If that thus means that we've shown that this action is uh, a geometric group action. Do you guys have any questions? So you were sending the zero point to infinity, and you're sending infinity to. Uh, right. So what what is what does A do? A uh, takes the plane around this point. 
and rotates at 180 degrees. And so the A will take this point right here and send it to, to infinity. And then B, um, So the question about, about how B acts on negative 1, correct? Right, and so B will act on negative 1. I, f I feel like it's I'm getting confused on which way this is rotating, but... So there's a, there's a formula, right? So B goes to Z to minus 1 over Z plus 1. So... Right, so this... Z is 0. It goes to minus 1. Right, right, but Z, if Z is, is negative 1 here, it'll send this point minus up one. to... Plus infinity, yeah. And infinity, you can plug that into... Infinity goes to 0, right? Minus 1 over Z plus 1, Z is infinity. So it, it interchange 0 goes to minus 1, minus 1 goes to infinity, infinity goes to 0. There we go. That makes sense. And A alternates 0 for 0. Right. So right, so A is like this this order two rotation, and B is in, in order three rotation. Right. So it's not at all obvious from the definitions, or really from any of these things. But these are uh, these are isometries. So they're not isometries of the Euclidean plane, of course, but they are isometries of the hyperbolic plane. Right. So that's A is a rotation around with uh, around the point one. 180 degrees, and B is a rotation around that other that left, lower left-hand shaded point there, of one third of the way around. Right. So one of one of the, the the so the idea of distance on the on the hyperbolic plane, you know, when we're looking at this uh, as a model of the hyperbolic plane, is um, is a little different. So it's the it's the the path between the shortest distance between those two points, and then distance is the integral along that path of 1 over y dz. Um, and so, like, I found it a little difficult to sort of, like, can, like see what that meant as far as what the shortest path was. Um, but what that did mean was that the distance was a lot more, that sort of two points that are visually, like, close to each other, like, up here, are actually much further away from each other down here. And so you can sort of see how that even though all of these triangles appear to us to be all different sizes, they're actually all the same size. Because they get, you know, as these guys get small, as they get, they approach the, the real axis, they're actually staying the same size. Well, and um, in hyperbolic geometry, distance is almost entirely defined by the intersecting, or the angle of the lines intersecting, right? Like the reason we were able to draw an octagon in hyperbolic space because the all the angles are the same even though it got further away. Those angles stay the same. Does that make sense? Yes. And this also, when it, both A and B, when they act on uh, complex numbers, if you look at it in the, either the I theta form, it doesn't change theta, I'm pretty sure. Right. So then it makes sense that it acts in isometries and hypothesis? Um, the, the thing was that the, well, I would be willing to, to, to bank on that. My, my problem with sort of using that was that I, it was hard for me to, you know, that this curve is the shortest distance between these two points. And it was hard for me to intuit immediately what that meant. Does that make sense? And so while it would, you know, once I, you know, do more work to understand how to compute distances between these points and sort of to how to see these paths. Like, I mean, it's one thing to say, it's like, oh, right, the path is the arc of a circle, but which circle? And, you know what I mean, is, but anyway, yeah, so like which circle and how to draw a circle and how big of that circle is, I mean, that's, some, that's stuff that depend. you know what I mean, that really affects what the, the angle between these, between these two lines are, which is why, um, I mean, I'm very interested in that, but I, I didn't get a chance to, to look at that too hard. Yeah, so if you know that these are isometries, which is something that needs to be proved, but if you know that they're isometries and you know that, that A is a rotation around this point and that B is a rotation around this point by a third, then you can figure out a lot of, a lot of you know, like where points go. So like, for example, these three G.6 here, these three that all go through this point, 
they all meet at 60 degree angles. So if you rotate by a third, you're going to take this one to this one. Right, that's one third of the way around. You're going to take this one to this one. You're going to take the point, wherever this is, zero, up to infinity. Mm -hmm. And you're going to take, you know, this one is going to go around uh, that one. So you better take the point one to the point minus two. And I bet if you plug in one into the formula, you get minus two. So, uh, so once you know that there are isometries, and you know that that's what kind of isometries they are, a rotation by pi and a rotation by two pi over three, then that can't help you figure out where points go. Okay. Any other questions? Um, thank you very okay. so much. Thanks, Ed.